ندرسن الا في الكتاب المبين. ان شاء الله we're going to start this uh, class uh, we'll be reading the aqidah or the creed of Imam al-Tahawi rahimahullah who was a great uh, Egyptian Hanafi jurist who uh, has compiled many great writings in various sciences uh, including the legal sciences, hadith, uh, even the science of Quranic recitation and even though his writings are many volumes, uh, you know, multiple volumes, this is a very short, uh, almost pamphlet you can say and it's really a drop-down list of all of the points of our belief as the people of Sunnah and Jama'ah. Uh, so before I get into the book, uh, we'll read together. I just wanted to make some brief introductory remarks, as I, I usually like to do, just sort of to place what it is uh, that we are doing. Uh, I was asked by uh, Sidi Hisham, uh, al may Allah protect him, to teach this class. And out of respect for uh, Sidi Hisham, I comply, of course. He doesn't have to ask, he just could just tell me to do it and I'll do it. But he asked out of his uh, politeness. And his concern, when we spoke about this on the phone, he told me that his concern was that he gets a lot of questions about belief. And he said, you know, I, I, I answer the questions for the murids and, and the people that ask me, but I started to be concerned that there's a bigger problem that questions and answers cannot solve the problem alone. So he said he wanted me to teach something very simple uh, in our creed. And this is one of the symptoms of uh, the times, or the problems of the times that we live in, is that a lot of times we just inherit some sort of identity that we call Islam, but it really is like a cultural identity that has some sort of... Uh, you know, baggage, and it's not really vetted, it's not really thought out, we just sort of inherit it, we just grow up in a world that I'm a Muslim and that's what I believe in. But being a Muslim, part of being a Muslim is to be informed. You know, they say that uh, a democracy only works if you have an informed public. You can't have a democracy if people don't understand the political system, understand how officials are elected, understand how you make legislation. <coughs> how you can take things to court and, and litigate, for example, and adjudicate. It requires an informed public. Religion is really the same thing. You have to be informed. Religion is not meant to be followed blindly. Religion is not meant to be uh, uh, something that's sort of an afterthought. But religion is what binds us to the divine. That's what the word religion means. The origins of the word in the English language is that which binds us to the divine. And in Arabic we call it a deen. And a deen comes from the Arabic word dayn or, or debt. This is the debt that we owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, for being created and for being part of this religion. And one of the things about creed or theology or belief, or, you know, all these words sort of interchanged, interchangeable, is that our belief has to be based on certainty. Each one of us, this is what we call in Arabic, fardu'ayn. This is individually obligatory on every Muslim. Every Muslim is ob individually obliged to know with certainty these things that we will discuss. And they're not, you know, we're not talking about very overly complicated, esoteric, philosophical, theologic things. We're talking about belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belief in God, and all of the things related to our belief in God. That's one area of research in the science of theology, in our religion. And then the second area is all of the belief about the Prophet ﷺ. Because our entry into Islam is based on the testification of, of faith. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ. So what does this mean that you believe that there's one God but Allah, only one deity, and that Muhammad ﷺ is his messenger? So these are the two main chapters or areas of research of theology. And the third are the things to come, what we call the science of eschatology. What will happen in the final hour and what will happen in the hereafter. These are the three main areas, very broad areas of belief. And you can understand by the nature of them that you can't have doubt. And you can't, people have doubt, that's one thing. But the quest of each individual Muslim, male or female, old or young, is that we have to arrive at this certainty. I am certain in my belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
I'm certain in my belief about the Prophet I'm certain about what is to come as we have been informed. And this certainty can't come from compulsion. You can't force somebody to have the certainty, but it's an individual quest. And because of the seriousness of this science, the ulama compiled these very short treatise, uh, pamphlets almost, to help facilitate the discussion. So this is not a very complicated text. This is not a very complicated discussion, even though we're dealing with major questions, to help us understand and elicit some of the uh, questions that people might have regarding these things, all with the aims of arriving at what we call correct belief, sound belief, certainty. Why do we have to have the certainty? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately wants for us happiness. In this world and in the hereafter. Allah ta'ala says in Surah Taha, مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى We have not revealed this Qur'an for you to be miserable. But this is here to liberate us. So if our Islam somehow uh, causes us to be miserable or depressed or despondent, then something is wrong with the Islam that we have understood. Just like people, all they hear about, like this man who, who stood up and he asked uh, uh, Donald Trump about Muslims and Muslims and how the president is a Muslim and we have to get rid of them. And This man is forgiven because this is all he knows about Islam. Even from the way he was speaking, even from the question he doesn't understand. He thinks the president is a Muslim, for example. This person has something in his mind called Islam. It's not Islam, it's something else, but he called it Islam. So he rejects that which is in his mind. And many of us, we have these false structures that we call Islam, or we attribute to Islam, but it's not from Islam. And that's why we have to arrive at certainty. So we have a crystal clear relationship with our Maker. Another, uh, another goal of the science, or why we have this, is that the science of theology or, or aqidah or you know kalam or whatever we call it, <clears throat> creed, always emerged throughout our history to respond to heresy and to respond to heterodoxy. And heresy and heterodoxy are things that are not of the religion, things that are incorrect. Uh, for example, you know, if, if someone a simple example that everyone can understand, if everyone, if someone, for example, started to say that. You know, there's two gods. There's the good God and the bad God. You know, there's Allah and there's like the bad God or something like that. It's a heresy. It's not correct. But if this started to spread and it went viral, you know, people started talking about it and commenting on it, then the ulama would emerge and they would address it. And this is how the science really formed. It formed as a response to heresy. Because in the beginning, there were, these con controversies didn't exist as much. They, they sort of seeped in later. And one of the reasons why we're doing this uh, now is because we have what we, we could call heterodoxical teachings that need to be responded to. And these people parade themselves, now this is within in the tribe, you know, within the family of, of Islam. They parade themselves as Muslims, as pious Muslims even, but their whole belief structure is completely heretical, is completely wrong. And it has led to an absolute global disaster, an absolute mess. And this is the Islam that we sort of have grew, grown up in the West, particularly inheriting, not realizing that there's almost heretical elements in it. And we're, we're going to talk about, we're going to highlight all of them as we go, but this is how these type of things emerge. Uh, in the very early uh, part of our history, this emerged as a response to the rational school that was known as the Maltesalites. And the Maltesalites, and I, I'm sorry for the technicality, we, we, you don't have to know the technical things, we're, we're going to get into it very quickly. But just so you guys have a, I want you to have a feeling of, of why this is important and what we're talking about. The Maltesalites, they had some unorthodox teachings. A few, not, not many, but a few key, like really serious things, but they were state-sponsored. They were sponsored by the state. They were sponsored by the ruling party of the time. And it was in response to the Mu'tazilites that Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, who was the founder, you can say, or the eponym of the Ash'ari school, which is the school of Ahl sunnah it was his response to the rationalists, the Mu'tazilites, that established this science. And that's why we call the people of Sunnah Ash'aris. Because you call, you, you call uh, uh, usually these schools of thought, and these are loose terms, school of thought, or madhab, or whatever, 
to the person who started it or made something big, like Imam al-Shafi'i, he wrote down his usul al-fiqh, and for example, I follow the Shafi'i school, so I am a Shafi'i. That doesn't mean that everything Imam Shafi'i said was, was right necessarily. There were people that came after to comment and to add to him, but we follow his way of reasoning. And the vast majority you know, of, of Sunnis are Ash'aris, and the minority are Maturidis, which is another school. And the differences between the two are only sort of lexical. There are some different terminology. And these are the two schools of thought that make up Sunni belief. And unlike the law, where you know you ask a sheikh a question or a mufti a question, you know there's like a thousand answers. In aqidah, there's no thousand answers, one answer. Because this is based on certainty. This is based on sound texts. It's not like the law where there's a lot of wiggle room. And you can take weak uh, evidence and weak opinions and... You know, in some countries, for example, in some Sunni countries, they take some, even some of the Shia uh, legal rulings for the law of the land. Like in Egypt, some of the legal rulings that we have in our code are barred from the Ja'fari Madhab. There's a lot of crisscrossing. But now when it comes to theology, when it comes to theology, it's very, very narrow. Why? Because we're dealing with mega issues. God, the Prophet Wasallam, the hereafter, and things like that. So it's, it's important that we study this and we learn this so that we ourselves are comfortable in what we believe in so that we can arrive at this happiness. The point of all this is to make us happy, really. We want to be happy at the end of all of this, not to be depressed and things like that, and not to go out and, and think that we have to you know, start accusing everyone of disbelief and things like that. That's heretical. That's not the way of the, of the sunnah. And the reason that this we call ourselves Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, the people of sunnah and the group, is that we follow the entire teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, the whole thing together, and we follow the vast majority of the, of the generations that came after the Prophet ﷺ. So I'm not, yes? Can you just, real quick, just, can I move the men up to the front of the room? Men forward? Men forward, so that the women can go in the back. Sorry. You are in charge? We're always inconsiderate, and women are always those that are considered. So, inshallah, as we progress, we're going to highlight those issues that are related to these research topics of God, the Prophet Wasallam, and the, the hereafter, or the last days and the hereafter, that might be common today that people talk about. That's important that we highlight that, because I want everyone to understand that uh, when someone says something wrong, when it comes to creed, it's serious. It's like a real problem. Because a fissure starts in our belief and then everything else can sort of crumble after that. So it's very, very important that we, we highlight that. Okay? We're all on the same page? Okay, so inshallah we're going to begin. If, there, if anything that I say is not clear, uh, please raise your hand and we can answer the questions uh, right away. If something is maybe slightly not related, maybe you can write it down and at the end we'll leave some time. But I like this to be interactive, a little bit interact, not too interactive, because we want to get through this. And if there's something, you can ask anything you want, but my only rule is that if I don't know the answer, I reserve the right to say I don't know, and give me some time to look into it, and I can get back to you guys next week. Go ahead. Fairfront. Can you uh, get into the point of predestination versus free will? Yeah, so that's part of the belief that's going to come. I don't, I don't know exactly the point, but it's... Um, Pre, uh, free will and predestination is a, a, a major uh, sub-chapter of belief. Uh, we're going to get into that. Uh, the, you know, the trailer or the teaser is that we believe in free will. Uh, that's the Sunni belief. Uh, and we don't believe in, uh, but we also believe that there is predestination. And we'll talk into that. There's a sort of a combination of that view, which probably leaves you all confused. But that's, we'll get into that, inshallah. Okay, we're, we're all good? Okay, so I'm going to read from a particular translation. I apologize if you don't have it, but we have somebody <coughs> following me with uh, the translation that was sent out on the email on this. Okay, because the translation, the, the, the text that I'm going to read has the English and the Arabic, and I need the Arabic with me uh, as I read for my own sake. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> so, in the tradition of um, Al Azhar, which is my, uh, the tradition of how I, w I, t I was taught these things. 
We read every text, every letter and every word of the text. Uh, and when we begin, we say, قَالَ الْمُصَنِّفُ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ وَنَفَعْنَ بِهِ وَبِعُلُومِهِ فِي الضَّرَيْنِ آمِينَ The author has said, may Allah have mercy on him and may we benefit from his knowledge in the two abodes, Amin. And this is how we begin. Why do we begin like this? Because this is a tradition. We have a tradition of learning, that we have inherited this knowledge from those that have come before us. It doesn't mean that those who have come before us are infallible. But we honor the tradition. And this is a text of authority. What does that mean, it's authority? Because there's no... In, in very rare occasions, other than very rare occasions, there are no verses. This is Imam Tahawi's writing. So why isn't this like Quran and Sunnah only? Where, why, don't I, why don't I just have the Quran here and the Sunnah here and, and I'm just reading? Because this is, you know, he's a mujtahid, he's a very high caliber of, a, of an alim. And he wrote this and the Ummah accepted this generation after generation. And because of that, this text has now become authoritative. And that's one of the things that our tradition builds generation after generation, text upon text. And that's how, that's what real authority is. Real legal and religious authority are the sources that we use. His sources are the Qur'an and the Sunnah. This particular text has been commented on by different ulama at different ages. And this is how we add layers of authority, okay? So everything we are reading is the Qur'an and the Sunnah, is based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but he's writing it in simple terms. So he begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, of course. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Everything, kullu amrin dibal, every important matter that does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, fahuwa akhta, aw fahuwa ajzam. So it is cut off from khair, it's cut off from barakah. So when you begin something, what do you say? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Right? Everything, every, that's like the go-to dua. You wake up, you sleep, you, uh, you go into the shower, you change, you eat. Everything is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Because we want to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that we do. And this is how we infuse our life with our connection. That's why we're not, you know, I'm just Muslim on Friday from, from like 12.30 to 2 o'clock. You're Muslim all the time, but you still live a normal outward life, but you... Direct everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Praise belongs to God alone. The Lord of the worlds, the most learned scholar, the proof of Islam, Abu Jafar al-Warraq al-Tahawi from Egypt. May Allah, or may God shower him with mercy. So this is not biased that he's an Egyptian. It just happens to be that he's Egyptian. And most, uh, most of the ulama, um, Egypt has been blessed to have produced many ulama and many of the sciences. And from the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with is that he has made me an Egyptian. And Imam al-Sha'rani, rahimahullah, who was one of the great uh, Sufis of, of our age, who was one of the uh, great commentators of the thought of Ibn Arabi, he said, min man manna Allah alayhi and innahu ja'alani min al-Misriyin. He said, from the things that Allah has blessed me, with he has made me amongst the Muslim, uh, the Egyptians. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. He states the following is an exposition of the creed of the people of the prophetic way and the majority of scholars, what we call Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. In accordance with the understanding of Muslim jurists such as Imam Abu Hanifa and Nu'man ibn Thabit al-Kufi, Abu Yusuf Yaqub ibn Ibrahim al-Ansari, and Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah. These are the main ulama of the Hanafi school because Imam al-Tahawi, even though he started off as a Shafi'i, he, he changed his madhab to Hanafi and we ask Allah to forgive him for that change. It as a joke. It includes their beliefs about the theological foundations of the religion upon which they base their worship of the Lord of the worlds. Okay, so every action that we do is based on some kind of belief. Right? You know, you... You give to charity because you believe in the cause or you believe that Allah is going to reward you or something like that. You give a gift based on some kind of belief. Uh, you, you put such and such on your resume because you believe it's going to get you that job. You, you study this subfield because you believe it's going to do this and that for you. So there's always a belief associated even if we don't automatically always see it associated with our actions. So these are the, the things that we believe upon which our, our acts of worship are based. We assert about the unity of God as did Imam Abu Hanifa and the two aforementioned Imams, meaning Abu Yusuf and Muhammad ibn al-Hasan, may Allah have mercy on them, believing with providence that God is one without partner. 
Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna Allah wahidun la sharika la. Allah is one without partner. What does this mean? This means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in His essence, what we call Dhatullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in His attributes, Sifatullah. So even though Allah is the all hearing and the all seeing and the all knowing and the all this and the all that, all of these are one because they are attributes of the one. So Allah is one in His essence and He is one in His actions, He is one in His attributes. Does it mean that there's a moon god and a rain god and a sun god and a winter god? All of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is one in His essence and one in His attributes. Just like the sun is one sun and the rays of the sun belong to the sun. That's how the ulama sometimes explain it. The sun itself, the star, the sun and its rays are the same and it's one. Nothing is like Him. وَلَا شَيْءَ مِثْلُهُ Nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ عَلِيمٌ Allah says in the Qur'an, Nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is the all-hearing and the all-knowing. What does that mean that nothing is like Him? It means that we cannot, with our human capacity, picture God. We cannot understand the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> Allah is not an old white man with a white beard sitting on a white chair on a white cloud. Nor is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this or that, nor is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here or there, because all of these are constructs that we have been given as human beings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His hearing is not like our hearing. His seeing is not like our seeing. His knowing is not like our knowing. These are attributes that Allah Ta'ala describes Himself with so that we may understand in our own limited capacity what Allah is capable of doing. But there is nothing like Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala ever. And nor should we ever assume that we can make an example of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So our religion is based on absolute monotheism. And this is one of the things about Islam when people study it from this vantage point. <clears throat> Can I get a, a bottle of water under my throat? It's so parched, I'm sorry. What, from this vantage point, people are shocked at this awesomeness that we put in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing can reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't draw Him, you can't picture Him. Nothing is like Him. And nothing debilitates Him. There is nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't do. There is nothing that is too much for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, the Prophet وسلم, he tells us in a hadith, which is one of the famous hadith of the 40 of Imam al-Nawi, if all of the people gathered to help you with something, or benefit you with something, they would not be able to benefit you with that thing, except if Allah wills it. And if everyone, past and present, the Prophet وسلم, says, not just now, all of humanity, from the time of creation till the end of creation, all of humanity gathered in one spot to harm you, they would not be able to harm you except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed that for you. You can't fight God. You know like this movie scene of the captain on the ship, you know, in the storm. And he's like, gonna, he's like yelling at God like an idiot, like he's going to conquer the wave and he's going to conquer. That doesn't exist. Nothing debilitates Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something, all he has to say is, kun fayakun, be and it is. Wala ilah ghayru. No deity exists save Him. There are no partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor big nor small, nor male nor female, old or young. There are no partners, no deity, no power, no ability except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And that's why we say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no power or ability except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing can impact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is pre-existent without origin, eternal without end. قَدِيمٌ بِلَا اِبْتِدَاءٌ دَائِمٌ بِلَا انتهاء. And Imam al-Tahawi's 
language is very precise. He is pre-existent without origin. What we say in Arabic in the language of theology, Qadim. Because Qadim in Arabic means old. But in theology it means pre-existing without origin. Allah has no beginning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal without end because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the beginning and the end. And Allah is the creator of all dimensions including the dimension of time. And I want you to keep that in your mind to answer the question about predestination and free will, etc. It's very important that we keep in mind that time is a dimension. And Allah is the creator of this dimension and all dimensions. We are confined by dimensions, but Allah is the creator of that. But here, Imam Tahawi is telling us that He is eternal. There is no beginning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the um, rational elements of the science, or one of the things that the theologians look out for, is what we call in Arabic a tasalsul, which is a re an infinite regress. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a beginning, then who caused that beginning? And then who caused that cause of the beginning, which is an infinite regress? And in the science of theology, the infinite regress is an impossibility. It leads us to, to nothing. It's nonsense. So that's why Allah is pre-existing without beginning and eternal without end. Allah's not going to end, nor did He begin. Allah was, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He said, Allahu kan Allahu. Allah was and there was nothing with him. And then the Sufis they add, and he is now as he always was, which we talk about maybe before the dhikr. He neither perishes nor ceases to exist. Okay, Allah doesn't have a, a timeline, doesn't have a half life, it's not going to end. He is the source of of all creation. He is the source of all life. He is the source of all dimensions, of all measurements. He is, and there is nothing with Him. Nothing will be except what He wills. Nothing happens in this universe except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills it. This is very, very important for us that we have to remember this. And this is the verse that I begin with in the, uh, when I teach. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the keys of the unseen. No one knows him except him. Not a leaf falls from a tree. Not a creature stirs in creation except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about it. And furthermore wills it. Nothing happens in this universe except by Allah's permission. We see a calamity happens, it's by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody sins, somebody hurts a saint, somebody blows up a shrine, somebody gets cancer and dies, a child is hit by a car, it is by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, if you are blessed with a child or you're married or you get a promotion, it's by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not in control, Allah is in control. And this, everything that we see, is Allah's, including us. Allah does what He wants with His own creation. It's like when you buy something, you think, oh, this is mine, I can do what I want. Or when you, your kid comes to you and says, well, it's my money, I can buy whatever I want. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything in the creation, everything in the universe, in the created universe belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and nothing happens. Not a star orbits, not a black hole exists. Not an ant moves except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think of that's who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. It's not like some clockmaker who made it and is sort of hanging out. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge. Imagination cannot attain him. Comprehensions cannot perceive him. You cannot imagine the awesomeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nor comprehend the magnitude of what we're talking about. But you can experience it with your heart. You can experience it with your soul. This is one of the miracles of our creation of human beings is that as awesome as Allah Ta'ala is, as intense as God is, we can experience Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's why we have, this is not, Islam is not just this little list of like 105 points. Islam is also to feel and experience 
the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Creatures do not bear any similarity to Him. So we are not a religion that condones anthropomorphism, which is to put human traits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are human. We have our own uh, human error and our own weaknesses and our own, own abilities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like that at all. Nothing that in His created world, you can't say Allah is like the lion you know, of the jungle or Allah is like you know, Hercules or something like that. No, nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alive, He never dies. All sustaining, He never sleeps. One of Allah's names is Hay. Allah is Hay all the time. Alive is in, in essence and in attributes all the time. There is no dying of these attributes. All sustaining. Allah Ta'ala doesn't need something to keep Him going. He doesn't need, you know, a Red Bull so He can keep going. He doesn't need to sleep so He can rest. A sinna in Arabic is like that. You know, like when the sheikh, uh, the questioner asks the question too long, the sheikh says, like that. He's like, he's like, doze off. Allah does not doze off, nor does he sleep. He doesn't need to rest. He doesn't have those type of limitations. We're okay? Everyone's with me? Okay. He is the creator without any need to create and a provider without any stores of provision. Allah Ta'ala's attributes, what we call the asma, right, what we use in the tariq to worship Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala in our dhikr, these are the different attributes, and we say some of them, but there are many. Allah does not need to create something to be called the creator. He is the creator without creation having happened. Because there was a moment when there was nothing, and then there was a moment when there was creation. So even before that, even moment is in time. So. Do you, you understand maybe what I'm talk, trying to get at? Is that even without creating humanity or without creating the universe, Allah is still Al-Khalaq. He's still the Creator. Because He is one in His attributes and He is one in His essence. And the same thing with the provision. Even if He does not, have, even if he does not give from the provision, He is still the provider. And so on and so forth for all of the attributes. He seizes life without fear and resurrects without effort. Mumitun bila mukhafa, ba'ithun bila mashaqqa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not flinch, does not hesitate if he has to take life or if he decrees to take life. Why? Because we are his creation. لا يكون في الكون إلا ما يريد. Nothing happens in the universe except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He resurrects without effort. As He has created us, so He will cause us to die, so He will resurrect us without effort. He's not going to sweat. It's not going to be effort for Him. It's not like a workout for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all things that confine us as human beings. Kun fayakun. Be and it is. Whether it's life or whether it's death. Just as He possessed just as he was possessed of his attributes prior to his creation, what I was just saying, so he remains with the same attributes without increasing in them as a result of his creation coming into being. So he doesn't get special medal or special points because he created us. He's not more of a creator because he created us. He is the creator whether he created us or he did not create us. This is what he's saying. As he was before creation qualified with specific attributes, so he remains forever described by them. Even after the end of the creation, in whichever way Allah Ta'ala decides it to be, he is still the creator. He is still the provider, a razzaq He is still the sustainer. He is still uh, the giver and the taker, the giver of life and the taker of life. All of these attributes are part of the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are one with Him. And I know a lot of this is, you're like, okay, well, I, I'm, okay, I'm okay with that. But at that some point in time, people had a problem with this. Right? Because one of the things that we'll get to is the Qur'an itself. The Qur'an, we say, is the 
eternal, uncreated word of, of Allah. Believe it or not, there were people that were thrown in jail and tortured because they didn't believe in that. Not because they didn't pay their taxes, or not because they, you know, they, somebody died in, you know, operation table. They were because they didn't believe that the Quran was the. They believed that the Quran was created, and any which is a heresy. And anyone that said other than that, they were thrown into jail, like Imam Ahmed ibn Hamad radiallahu anhu. So at some point in time, people actually got worked up about these things. Now we get worked up about other things. We'll get to that. Maybe more when we talk about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So just if you guys are okay with this, that's good. That's that's be happy. But, you know, I just got to motivate you, inshallah. It is not after creating the universe that he merits the name the creator, nor through originating his creatures that he merits the name the originator. Okay, so he doesn't need us to be called that. Or he doesn't need to do something to be, to be, to have that attribute. He possesses the quality of sovereignty, with or without thief, and the quality of creativity with or without creation. So he's repeating it, but just using different... Attributes. <coughs> and while he is the resurrector of the dead, after he resurrects them, he merits the same name before their actual resurrection. Likewise, he merits the name the creator before their actual creation. Okay, so the, the, the takeaway from all of this is that all of Allah's attributes, al hay al qayyum Al-Salam, al mumit al mughith all of these attributes, they are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they are acted upon or not. They are part of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say, La ilaha illallah, this is all what's in that statement. Okay, so Allah is, is magnificent. Allah is awesome. Allah is beyond anything we could possibly uh, fathom. And this is a good thing. So how could we ever give up hope, for example, when this is who we worship, when this is who our creator is? You know, nothing, there's nothing that's insurmountable for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter, no matter how the, uh, difficult the odds. This is the belief that the companions had, right? This is the generation that we look to emulate. And this is the generation that the Qur'an describes. The, uh, when, the, uh, when the Israelites were fighting uh, in, in the Levant, in Palestine, Allah ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, the people will say to them, oh look, the people have gathered around you. You know, they're going to destroy you. And then Allah says, but the people of belief, they say, how many a small group, a minority, were given victory over the majority by the leave and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they attribute this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to their wits. Now it's all, everything is me, 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 I did this, I did that, my company did this, my company did that, I'm so smart, I'm so good. And you know, it can't fit everyone's ego in the room. But the Sahaba, even though they accomplished things that were even more miraculous than things that we see today, they attributed all of this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the, the difference, you still have to do what we have to do in life, but we attribute this to Allah subhanahu we know, not at, just at, we know that this is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is because he is omnipotent. In Arabic, إِنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Everything he can accomplish. Everything he is able over. That's what omnipotent is. Everything is dependent upon him. Ooh. Everything is dependent on him. At every moment. Not, yeah, Allah created me, but like I'm on, I'm on cruise control. No, we are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every micro moment. Every breath, every beating of the heart, every breath that we take, every time we blink, all that massive chaos that's going on inside our body and blood and nerves and all of these things, all of this is happening in these micro moments. We begin the Akira class after the what we decided to do before the Every micro moment, kun fayakun, kun fayakun, kun fayakun, kun fayakun, kun fayakun. Allah is saying, be and it is, be and it is. So we are dependent on Allah for everything at every moment. And this is what we call the Ash'ari uh, or the Sunni theory of uh, atomism. That at each atom moment, each atomic moment, is connected to each atomic moment by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is sometimes where modern, the modern world helps us maybe a little bit understand more. You know, in the old days when there used to be something called a movie theater, 
and there used to be a cinema reel in the old days. I know people don't know what that is. Everyone thinks it's just Netflix now or Hulu, but there used to be like this reel, right, in the movie theater up in the back. And what is the movie that we watch in the in the theater? How many people have seen a movie in a, in a theater? It's okay, I won't, I won't tell Shikha so. Shambhi. Everyone, everyone's seen a movie in a theater, right? What is that really, what's happening if you, in the reel? The reel are just stills. Remember like when we used to draw something on a piece of paper and you go like this and the, the character moves, like the stick figure moves? That's what the, the film is. The film is just a series of stills on the reel and there's light that's projected on that and it, you know, it moves and then that's why you see what's happening. And then when like, the power goes out in the movie theater or like in, in, the, in the third world where they didn't have the American machines that could take the whole movie but they had to split the movie, there's like intermission and like it stops at the end and they have to take off the reel, it moves. And by moving the still, still by still by still, and casting light on it, you see the action. But when you sit and you see it and you watch the movie, you, you sort of forget all of that. You're, like, you're just watching the movie, you're really into it. Right? But if the power went off, you're going to see the thing will freeze. That's like the atomic theory that we have. That's what life is like. Life is just a series of stills. And each still is connected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing it to connect by saying be and it is, meaning that Allah is like super active, right, at every micro, nano moment. So this is a massive thing when you contemplate it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that. That's why Allah ta'ala says in the Quran, If my servant asks you about me, indeed I am near. He is near. Because he is allowing all of these moments to connect. So everything is dependent on him. And every affair is effortless for him. Allah doesn't need, doesn't, doesn't uh, take away from Allah's battery life to do something. There is no battery life. He is. He needs nothing. And then he quotes the verse, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ In chapter 42, verse 11, there is nothing like him, yet he is the hearing and the seeing. And this sort of summarizes the points that we've been talking about before. We, uh, we all good? Any questions? All right. <clears throat> uh, Rod, are we, is the, are we sort of in sync with what you're reading, or have I yeah. confused everything? Yeah, we, we just finished number 17. Okay. I don't think Imam al-Tahawi actually numbered them. I think it was just yeah. like a... Yeah, but this is yeah, and so this is also numbered. Yeah. I just have one question. Yes, sorry. Andre. So when we say like Allah doesn't create something to be known, um, He's uh, uh, He doesn't need anything to be known. So there's a saying like Allah says that He was a hidden treasure and wanted to be known. So if you could comment on that. <clears throat> so a lot of people they think this is a hadith. It's not a hadith. This is a statement, uh, and. When we come to talk about these type of, the question that she's asking for people that didn't hear, that there's a statement that people oftentimes say is a hadith, in which the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah Ta'ala says, I was a hidden treasure, kuntu kanzan makhfiyya. And I wanted to be known, so I created creation to be known. Okay? This is not a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ didn't say this. This does not mean that the statement is not true. When you say a hadith, it means that there's a chain of transmission linking it back to the Prophet ﷺ. There's no chain of uh, linking it back to the Prophet ﷺ. But that doesn't mean that the statement is not true. So we have to be able to weigh these things. People don't understand these subtleties. Oh, astaghfirullah, this is not a hadith. Okay, sorry, it's mia kopa, it's not a hadith. But it's true. What does this mean? That one of the reasons behind why, are we do, why did Allah create all of this is to be known, is to be worshipped. And this is, some, this is from the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sort of in our minds, we might see this, well, that's arrogant. Well, you know, but this does not belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He is the creator. He is the only creator. And He wanted to be worshipped. And to be known for this greatness, because that's what God is. So He created the universe to be known. And this is one of those statements that the uh, Sufis uh, and, and some of the, peop the, the saintly people, they, you know, they recite generations. Of, and it's absolutely true. I mean, this is a true statement, a true reason behind creation. It's not necessarily the only reason behind creation, but it is the, 
the high level ultimate reason behind creation that everything that we do, everything that we've been ordered to do reflects back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the Quran, there are three things that Allah has asked from creation. And this is sort of how we answer why were we created. One is to worship. I have not created man and the jinn, man meaning man and woman. I have not created human beings and the jinn except to worship. Which proves that this statement is true. Because this is what the statement is saying. That I, I created creation to be known. What does it mean to know Allah? It's to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To say, La ilaha illallah, to, to pray, to fast, etc. So number one, Allah Sa'ala says, I created mankind and jinn only to worship. That's the only reason, he says, not to do anything else to worship. The other one, Allah Ta'ala has asked us to purify ourselves. And many other verses. Allah says on the tongues of the the prophets say uh, uh, on the tongue, Allah Ta'ala says on the tongues of the prophets that Allah has created, has sent the messengers to purify them. So self-purification, tazkiyah, is one of the purposes behind creation. It's not enough to just, well, this is the way I am. You have to improve. We are called to a higher moral standard, which is why we have the science of, or the art of the, or the way, the tasawwuf of the tariq. And development, or what we say in Arabic, amara, to build the universe that Allah Ta'ala has created us and caused us to dwell fiha <coughs> about earth meaning he has asked us to build it in Arabic the verb form is tafala means that he's been asked so I say uh, 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 I ask you to open the door so when Allah Ta'ala says fiha, meaning Allah has asked us humanity to build this world you can't just mope around. You've got to do something with your life. And you have to do something that reflects the principles upon which the creation is based. So it all goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is sort of how you can understand this statement. Anybody else? Well, I think uh, when we finish, I have a question. I I okay. To remember the question. He originated the creation with omniscience. <laughs> Okay, Allah created through His knowledge, through His infinite knowledge. He measured out the lots of all He created. Everything has been created with its lifespan. Everything has been created with what it's going to achieve and what it's going to accomplish. He determined the spans of their life. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created us. Each one of us has an expiry date. Not just us, but all of creation. Stars and the universe and insects and etc, etc, etc. I mean, we know this, right? That we are going to die. Unless anyone doesn't think that's going to happen. Which is a more serious problem. <laughs> None of their actions were concealed from him before he created them. He knew what they would do before he created them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before he creates will know what creation will do because they are creation, his creation. Okay, so now maybe if somebody's thinking, well then there's everything is predestined and pre predetermined, we'll get to that. But nothing is concealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't say Allah doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Because there is no tomorrow for Allah. Allah's not in time. That's putting Allah in a dimension. And that's why we have these first, you know, 17 or whatever points that we read. That nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no yesterday, today, and tomorrow for Allah because it's all one moment. It's all happening because He's outside of time. Allah's outside of the dimensions. Just like Allah's not in the sky or Allah's not beneath the carpet or something like that. Allah's not confined by the dimensions. <clears throat> he commanded them to obey Him. Make sense? And prescribed them, pres prescribed them from disobeying Him. So we're supposed to obey Allah and not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All things are in accordance with His determination and will, and His will is fulfilled. Okay, nothing happens except if it's Allah's will. That's what it means, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And that's the whole point of the tariq. The whole point of the path to Allah is to realize that statement. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no power, no ability 
except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't do anything. You can't accomplish anything. Nothing can happen to you. You can't affect anything except if Allah allows it to happen. Allah is the only able power, the only creative power, the only sustaining power there is in the created world. There is nothing else except that. And this is why, for example, we don't say things like, or when people say, well, why do good things happen to bad people? You know, why do good people suffer? Why is this happening to these children in Syria, so on and so forth? This is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not saying, but we know what the will means or what's the hidden meaning behind it. We don't know that. That's above our pay grade. We, don't, we just don't know. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. But we know that Allah is a rahman al rahim that Allah is merciful, and Allah is compassionate, and Allah is loving, and wudud, and latif. So we know all of these traits about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we get to that. So behind the ulama, they say behind the jalal is the jamal. Behind the something that appears negative, or something that appears austere, or something that appears rough, is the beauty that Allah has, behind that is beauty. And Allah always manifests between these two names, and Jamal and Jalal, the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And behind every Jalal, uh, behind every Jamal is Jalal, and behind every nicety or beauty or mercy, there could be something austere or powerful. So sort of an esoteric sort of side commentary. But the point is, is that sometimes we are strapped with this way of thinking like what so honestly why do these catastrophes happen to these innocent people why are all these people displaced i was just with a, a colleague uh, today he came back from uh, new orleans and he was describing to me what people were saying about katrina i mean there were horrendous stories i mean, i thought he was talking about you know like a third world like war torn like syria or something this is in our own country he was talking about katrina and how people were drowning in their houses and how this lady gave birth on top of the house and she had to escape by a plank and all. it was unbelievable. Why? Why did this happen? What did she do? What did this child do? Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is His will. This is what we have to remind ourselves with and that's why we're doing this. We'll, we'll get into the answer to some of these questions. I'm just sort of, I'm trying to make this make sense to something that we maybe have heard or maybe even sometimes feel. <clears throat> His servants are without volition except what He wills for them. They don't think that we can accomplish something except if Allah gives us the ability to accomplish that. Which we call in the Ash'ari uh, lexicon, kasb or acu... Uh, like is, what, what, what is the English word? To acquire. to acquire. That we acquire this ability. <clears throat> so I want to grab this and pick it up means that I acquired at that moment the ability to do that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, and this is happening, as I said, at every micro moment. But usually, you know, we're like on cruise control, we don't think about that, but except when something incredible happens. So I, when something incredible happens, we remember, oh my God, la hawla la quwwata la billah, or something like that. Or like when something bad happens, your parents say, la hawla la But it happens all the time, it's also a good statement. So, we have no volition on our own. Except if Allah has given us the ability to do that thing. This is awesome stuff, guys. This is amazing. When you think about God in our belief system, this is amazing. Yeah. How does that tie in with sin? That you have acquired that ability to do the sin it does not necessarily mean that Allah is pleased that you sin. Or else then you get into this... Dichotomy, there's like a good God and a bad God, or some two for, force of light and force of darkness, like Manichaeism or something like that. But the existence of sin does not necessarily, it is a sign of Allah's will, but it does not mean it's a sign of Allah's pleasure of the sin. Let that percolate. <laughs> Thus, what He wills for them will be. Okay? Always remember this. Teach this to our children. Whatever Allah wants to happen is going to happen. doesn't matter. And this is like your... This is why we're like Muslims can be like superheroes. Seriously, because not, there's no fear. You know, I remember when we were young that no fear, remember? No fear. No fear. Right? Allah's in charge. Nothing can happen. Nothing can affect you except if Allah wants it to happen. 
doesn't mean to go out and do foolish things. Because we have to take by the asbab, because part of our tradition and part of the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ is you have to do things. You know, the Prophet ﷺ in the Battle of Uhud, he wore two coats of armor. Not one, but two. But Allah Ta'ala told the Prophet, Wallahu Yasimu Kamin in this, Allah will protect you from people. He didn't have like an entourage or a you know, car, a bulletproof car, something like that, or bulletproof camel. He didn't, ha he didn't have that. He, he was am one amongst the people. And because he didn't have a Facebook profile, no one knew what he looked like. So when they came into Medina, they're like, maybe he's the Prophet, maybe he's the Prophet. Maybe who's the guy lying behind the tree? Oh, that's the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, they didn't know who he was, but Allah said, Allah will protect you. Allah Yasimu Kamin in this. But even in battle, he wore two, co two coats of armor. It's like double vaccine, right? Double flu vaccine. But he took by the asbab. So we have to take by the asbab. This is part of our... We have to take by the, the, the means because this is part of our etiquette with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But don't let that fool you that that is what's in charge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge. Thus, what He wills for them will be. What He wills for us will be. And what He does not will for them will not be. And this is what destiny is. The Prophet ﷺ said, destiny, in the hadith of, of uh, Gabriel, when the Prophet ﷺ said, part of faith and iman is that you believe in al-qadr khayrihi wa sharrihi. That you believe in destiny, it's good and it's sour. It's good and it's bad. In another hadith, he said, destiny means that which hit you was meant to hit you. And that, was, that which missed you was not meant to hit you. So, you know, we have a lot of close calls in life. But that's our sort of, oh my God, that was like, I almost rear-ended that car. But from a theological, a creed point of view, that, that wasn't just meant to be. doesn't mean that we're sort of be arrogant and sort of just don't follow the rules because then you're going to run up against, you know, problems. But what it means is that if something does not happen, it just wasn't meant to be. If she says no to your proposal, it wasn't meant to be. If you didn't get the job, it just wasn't meant to be. Because this is Allah's will. And this is what Islam means and Muslim means to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what submission is. And this is the ultimate liberation. This is not like, yes it's servitude, we call ourselves the servants or the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have a generous master, a merciful master, a loving master and creator. So when we understand this and we submit to it, this is why we have ease and peace. He guides, protects, and preserve, preserves whomever He wills by grace. Bifadli. As He misguides, forsakes, and afflicts whomever He wills by justice. Adli. And this is a tough one, I know, a tough pill. But when something, when Allah Ta'ala, Yahdi man yasha, wa yasim wa yu'afi fadla. So this is from Allah's grace. If Allah has guided us, this is from the grace of Allah. All gratitude and praise to Allah that He has guided us to this. Because it is only by Allah's grace that we have been guided. Not because we're smart, not because we're special, not because we're chosen, we're chosen in that sense, uh, chose to guide us. Yes? What does grace mean? Allah's favor on us. Allah's favor on us. We have been guided, this is by Allah's grace. And Allah misguides or does not cause to be protected by His justice. From, from the contemporary lens, like you said, it's a very uh, challenging pill to swallow. How do you express that to people that don't believe or so? I mean, uh, I'm, I mean, so somebody that would say that I'm, I'm misguided or, or by the terms that are um, indicated in this book. Would be considered to be misguided. Um, it's, it's a very uh, harsh reality for somebody. Am I being able to candid with those words? No, no, this is why we're here. So, <clears throat> this is also short form, so maybe we can elaborate a little bit more. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, when they turned, Allah caused their hearts to turn. Not that Allah caused their hearts to turn. Like, like just they're out, you're sorry, you're screwed, you didn't make it. No, but they chose not to turn, to, they chose to turn. 
But who calls them, who gave them the ability to reject, to be consistent with our theology? They acquired that ability. But they chose to leave it. So with free will and, and destination, because it's part of that, you have to understand, um, like this uh, microphone stand thing, right? This is time. And this is, this is us on, on this moment. Okay, everything here is past. And here we are in the present, and everything here is future. But I'm on, so I'm like here, right? I'm at the moment. I can, I can remember what happened before. I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. But I'm here right now. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, so Allah belongs the, the best example, is outside, like where I'm sitting, looking at all of it as one moment. Allah created time and space and all dimensions and us. So everything for Allah is happening almost from the perspective of Allah is concurrent. So Allah knows what was going to happen and allows and wills at every micro moment things to happen. But He has created within us the ability to choose yes or to choose no, to choose right or to choose left, to choose to believe or to choose not to believe, which is why we are morally responsible for our actions. But to be consistent in our theology, Allah knows what we will choose. But Allah does not push us to choose. But destiny is more of like, if you choose this, then this will happen. If you choose this, this will happen. Allah causes the ability to be there, but creates in us the free will to choose A or B. Which is, in my mind, it, it works. It makes sense. I understand it. We, we can keep talking about it. I know we're not going to solve all problems now, and I'm not the best expositor of this, but I want you to think about the time and the out of time. Right. That's important to keep in mind, because sometimes when we think about this, we forget that time is also a dimension. And I want everyone to understand that our belief system is absolutely that we have free will. Which is why we get rewarded and we get, not rewarded, uh, sins for what we choose. But we cannot choose right or wrong, except if Allah allows us to choose right or wrong. But we are the ones ultimately that chose. And this is the miracle of the creation of the human being. Versus the angels, for example, that don't have free will. I mean, that's one of the differenti differentials between us and the angels. And I want us all, one second, I'm coming. I want, we, I want us all to remember at every moment that Allah is merciful and compassionate. That when we describe these things, we're trying to describe the awesomeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah, in our understanding, when we take it all collectively, is merciful, is kind, is gentle, is forgiving. And we'll talk about the people who are saved versus the people who are not saved. But like, for example, when he says this, I want you to think of Pharaoh. Right? He's not talking about you know, the people around us. Because I believe that every, these people will be saved. And this is the teaching of, of the Sunnah, and we'll get into to why that is. But I want you guys to think of Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh is the example. Even till today, you say this guy's like a Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh is the ultimate example of the guy who didn't believe. He was given every opportunity. You know, like, hello, McFly, like, aren't you seeing what's happening? Every opportunity. With the Nile turning red, and the frogs, and the this, and the that, and the sea being spell, all of these things. But what did he say? He said, build for me a tower. I want to see this God of Moses. And then Moses said, but my God gives life and death. He's like, I give life and death. You live, you die. He was this arrogance, right? This unbelievable arrogance. But he chose to act like that, even though all of the signs happened from Allah's justice. Because Allah is just at the same time. But if we go down that path, that's what we will face. But if we go down the path of mercy and love and forgiveness, we will face something else. A little bit? Oh, no, 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 I I'm trying, man. No, 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 it's very good. Yeah, the, the, the key is that... Yes, and also the, 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 the saying is, the Prophet said, كُلُّ مُيَسَّ لِمَا خُلِقَ لَهُ Allah, you have been created for a purpose, and Allah will make that purpose easy for you. You. Um, is so, it Maghrib time? Is that the Adhan? Yeah. Okay. So in this um, timeline that we live on, we have free will, we have more than one choice. Does that mean there's more than one end from Allah's point of perspective, or is there only one end? Yes, depending on the path that you take. Okay. 
there was this uh, really bad show, I can't remember what it was, but it kind of reminded me of this. There was a guy sitting in like a diner who had like a, a, a journal, and like this lady comes to him and is like, I want to be pregnant. And then he was like, he looks in the book and he's like, you have to go painting. You have to like take a picture. You guys know this, this? It's sort of like that. And like at the end, it's like discovered that his, uh, it looks like a blueprint almost. His journal looks like a blueprint. And he's saying, okay, you're here and you know, you want to have a baby. And the thing is, the lady was a nun, which is what was crazy. Like, why, why go paint? Because if you paint, then this is going to happen, then this is going to happen. It's sort of like that. But if you don't paint, it, I, I know it's not a very good example, but I'm sort of, I'm trying. But so, yes, infinite options in front of you, infinite paths. You are responsible for the path that you choose. But we cannot forget, because you have to be consistent, that if you choose this, or inshallah, we all choose uh, right, and Allah guide us and everything, inshallah. But for the purpose of teaching, we have to understand, you know, how do... We cannot say that somebody who chose not to believe sort of is outside of the ability of God because there's nothing outside of Allah's ability. That's the point, is to be consistent. So I want everyone to remember that, that our creed has to be consistent. If we say God is all-powerful all and all-knowing and before time and all that kind of stuff, well, how can this, when we come to this issue, Allah can't prevent that. Or how do you make that consistent? So that's sort of, but yes, the answer is, It's predetermined in the sense that Allah knows how you will choose and know which choice A will lead to choice B will lead to choice C. But you don't know. So from our perspective, it's free because we, just don't, we honestly just don't know what's going to happen. But you, nothing can be outside of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you get that? So by, by what he was saying, that I mean, your response was that you are responsible for, for the path that you choose, but there are multiple outcomes. But that's from the from the world of possibility, from from our perspective, but from from the perspective of the love. What you're saying is that there's the, the line is already written. The, the the your path and your the choices that you make, even how you weigh the choices. Not only no, not not that written. it's written. That it's happened already. It's even more than that. Because when you say it's already written, you are still speaking from the perspective of time. Allah is out of time. So it's all one moment. That's why when we die, Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an says, we will be asked, how long did you live? We'll say, yawman aw ba'dayam, which is a day or a moment. All this was just a moment. But for Allah, it's one concurrent moment. It's like water. You know, if I took this bottle of water that I've been drinking from, and I have a glass that has half full water, and I pour this, you cannot tell the difference between this water and that water. It's all it's a glass of water from our perspective. Time is sort of like that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all just examples. I mean, I'm not saying it's water. It's just all one moment, one uh, act of being. So even when we say it is written, that's from our perspective of time that it's going to happen. But we are on the dimension of time, and there are these infinite possibilities, and we will choose... And based on this, something else will happen, and there'll be another infinite levels of uh, options of possibility, and we choose so on and so forth. But Allah ultimately knows how we will choose, but we choose for ourselves. I know. Last <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you didn't you didn't mean to say that there's multiple possible outcomes. There's only one possible outcome. Multiple paths to get possible paths to get to the one outcome. There, I think you said multiple outcomes, but you didn't mean there's multiple outcomes. To this brother's question. There's multiple outcomes in from the from the perspective of possibilities. But not, not the final outcome. Well, because Allah knows what's going to happen. So there is one outcome from that point of view. I mean, Allah knows ultimately what will happen. But from our point of view, yes, there are the multiple scenarios. But we choose, and therefore we are responsible for our choice. Uh, I'm just in this Junaid is a very famous scholar, Junaid. He put theory about Tawheed. Every creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in his souls the oneness of God. This is, there is, nobody has doubt, especially Muslim. But my question is, because I am Muslim and I follow every event in Egypt, in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Bukhara, in Persian before Osun, at the end, at the end really, 
I ask, is this test or a crisis in faith? And the last part, Ta'ala, in many verses said, Prepare for them as you come power of brain, of technology, science. My, my question is, is very, very clear. Is, I know, what happened in the Muslim world is test or crisis hate belief. I don't know. <laughs> We have created but, but life and death to you. Yeah. Which one of you is best? Allah is best. Allah is the best. Allah is the best. Yes. You want to see his slave has honor. But the human is the best. Allah 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 is any event in Egypt because all my teachers from Egypt. One brother elected by people, one soldier dirty, make coup d'etat and put all the brother, kill all of them. What is our Islam? What is your faith? What is your Iman? That's why I let, let me really, really very sad. When you look to Algeria, to Bukhara, and you have everywhere at the end they ask is crisis of faith or test. I don't know. It's the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in the will of Allah yes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would like to ask to lead the, the all the nation in the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is. Because he said you, But you're talking about several things at the same time. So, we, one, no, one, that's what one, happened. One by one. One by one. That's what yeah. So, everything that happens, and the point is to answer the question based on what yeah. we read, everything that happens. Uh, uh, Nothing happens except if Allah exactly. wills it to happen. There is no doubt. No so this doubt. is Allah's will that it no happens. No doubt. If you look at Andalus, Spain, before 800 years, and the best cow was born in Spain, the Muslims sleep until one woman, she sweat, I will never change my gun until I take all Muslims out. If they think that what happened, they kill every Muslim, one woman. What, 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 what they do, Muslims? Is that, we, have bad, to, that's, that's, we have to understand this before we can understand all yeah, of these other things. We believe in Qadr, Adab Qadr, and but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would let us to lead the people. You see, Indonesia, before there is no Muslim in Indonesia. One Sahaba opened all Indonesia become Muslim. Why well, we have our, our faith is different from them? I don't know, me, I don't understand. You are uh, judging what's happening based on your definition of good and bad based on your definition of right and wrong. And the, the universe does not happen, things do not happen the way we want. Maybe this is good. Maybe it will, something good will come of it. That's why we say, Rubba durrat al Maybe uh, something bad Shalom and something Allah, good will happen. That's, what you and that's the whole point of this, is that we cannot judge these events based on, we're not a political scientist. This is not a class of political science. This is a class of aqidah. Why are these things happening? Because Allah wants it to happen. Allah Ghafur Rahim, of no, course no, Allah Ghafur Rahim. Atirad, no, no, I know, I'm just saying, so how do we look at the, the mess that we are in? Why did we happen? So we can come back. So we can come back to this, this, this what you're saying is insanity. But we've left the teachings of the Prophet <coughs> There are There are people that stand and they, they wear Islam and they stand on the member and they curse the Prophet <laughs> Brother, we, 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 in Tunisia, my country, but they put 30,000 Muslims in jail. And anybody who would, would like to fight, say, Billah, put him 20, 20 the, years. The Prophet وسلم, was expelled from Mecca. And they threw trash yes. on him. Yes. And they made him bleed. And they fought him. And they tried to kill him. And they killed his family. And they hurt his wives and they hurt his daughters. Are we better than the Prophet ﷺ? No. No. Why did this happen to the Prophet ﷺ? If anybody, if anyone had the right that nothing bad would happen to him or he was treated fair, it would have been the Prophet ﷺ. Because no. this is Allah's sunnah in this world. There is test and there is persecution. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not create us without causing us, to, without testing us to see. And that's why we have this to, to determine and decipher how do we explain and interpret the things that are happening to us. Any questions about specifically anything?
Yeah. Yeah, I have one. Um, so the difference between natural laws, so like there's things like gravity and, and other kind of processes that everything else operates with, is Allah's will the is Allah's will within the creation of these laws, or is it more like the instantaneous control on, <coughs> or control like approval or disapproval? You know what I mean? Of of, of things. Sorry, sorry, you have to repeat. I'm sorry. So, for example, like so, gravity is like a natural law. There's really nothing on Earth that escapes it. It's all like very like there's formulas for it. So, is Allah's will inherent in these natural laws that He created? So we have the book, and we go. If I raise it again, every, does anyone doubt that the book will fall? <laughs> Any doubters? Yeah. The book falls, right? What is that? And these of you, what we're reading, is this the question? Can I phrase it that way? <coughs> sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, there is no causality except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the, the Sunni answer. And this is the... Uh, What's his name? Jabri. Was it Hobbes? Or I think it was Hobbes. Uh, this is also ho the Hobbesian look of causality. He said, you know, if I take a rock and I throw it at the window, it's just our habit that we have habit been habituated that the rock will break the window. We have been habituated that the apple will fall from the tree. But there could be, theoretically, a moment where I threw the rock and the window didn't crash. Or I picked up the book and I dropped it and it didn't fall. It could happen. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the, what we call uh, sunan al kawniya or the natural laws, excuse me, the orbit and gravity and, you know, oxygen and things like that. But Allah is what causes A to affect B in everything. And that's why, for example, the fire didn't burn the body of Abraham when he was cast in the fire. Allah Ta'ala says, Ya nari kuni bardan wa salama on Ibrahim. O fire, be peace and tranquility on Abraham. And Abraham, alayhi salam, he says that the most joyous and peaceful moment of his entire life was when he was cast in the fire. And why the knife does not always cut. And we will, you, you experience these type of things, maybe not that dramatic. I mean, I doubt that if I ever hold the book, it's just going to be suspended. I mean, that's not going to happen. For me. But, but there are moments in our life that we experience, we're like, how on earth did that happen? Or how on earth did that not happen? You know, uh, and uh, sometimes we see this from a cinema point of view, and sometimes we see somebody that captures something on video that was like, that's all the odds were against it, or somebody was on their deathbed and they're cured and things like that. This reminds us that causality is only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we as human beings, we are ordered to function and live in our life through the natural laws that Allah gave. So I can't build. Brother, can you just move two feet to the right or left? Because I'm just talking. About oh, sorry. It. Yeah, it's okay. No, no, no. no that's, that's many feet. Many feet. <laughs> yeah. I can't build uh, a building based on the fact that, well, maybe gravity won't happen. Like, I can't do that. Like, I have to suspend things by the joists and the this and the that. Or, because Allah has ordered me to live in those natural laws. But I should not let those natural laws delude me at any moment from thinking that Allah Ta'ala is not allowing causality to happen. So there's a difference between our etiquette and what we are, we are ordered to live by these laws and our belief that, well, at the end of the day, Allah does what He wants. And causality is only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's happening instantly. I mean, like... Every micro, vimto, whatever moment, small <coughs> increment of time, it's happening. All right? Okay. So, um... Okay, we have to we have to pray. So let me just mark where we finish. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do a better job because I think we only got like two pages. <laughs> uh, okay. That's so. good. Look, I know that I know that some of this stuff is uh, intense. Uh, so we'll keep asking the questions. I'll keep trying to answer them. But I also want us to give us a chance to go through them because some of these issues will come up later. And inshallah, we'll, we'll try to understand them. Okay? And if the, again, if you have any question that we didn't get to, write it down. And inshallah, we'll answer it next week. Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa'ala.